We would like to acknowledge that the University of Illinois at Chicago resides on the traditional territories of the three fire peoples, the Ojibwe, Ottawa, and Potawatomi. The area was also a site of trade, gathering, and healing for more than a dozen other native tribes. The state of Illinois is currently home to more than 100,000 tribal members, with the Chicagoland area being the home of one of the largest and most diverse urban native communities in the U.S. By making a land acknowledgement, we recognize that indigenous peoples are the traditional stewards of the land that we now occupy, living here long before Chicago was a city and are still thriving here today. As we work, live, and play on these territories, we must ask ourselves what we can do to right the historic wrongs of colonization and state violence and support indigenous communities' struggles for self-determination and sovereignty. Thank you so much. I will now turn it over to our director. Thank you, Jocelyn, um, and good afternoon and welcome, everyone. I'm Rosa Cabrera, director of the UIC Rafael Cintron Ortiz Latino Cultural Center, or the LCC, as we call it. Um, thank you for joining us in our Climates of Inequality online series. And like um, Jocelyn mentioned, this is the last presentation in the second round of Climates of Inequality. In the fall of 2020, we presented local leaders working on environmental and climate justice in the Chicago area. In this fall, we have extended a conversation to um, ECJ champions from across the country and abroad. Um, our guest speakers are um, sharing different frameworks uh, and solutions that utilize a justice and equity lens to address the negative effects of climate change and exposure to toxic pollution, uh, which has disproportionately burdened communities where Blacks, Indigenous, and people of color live. The videos for both seasons are now available in the LCC website, and I believe there will be a link um, in the chat uh, so that you can access that at, at your own convenience. Today's program um, is bringing us the story of the Ironbound neighborhood in Newark, New Jersey. This is a burdened community sharing their neighborhood with multiple toxic facilities, including a super fun site, a trash incinerator, and numerous fossil fuels plants and factories. They have made the area one of the most contaminated land sites in the country, elevating the risk of climate change harms and COVID death. Ironbound is also home to environmental justice champions like our presenter today, who are holding polluters and state leaders accountable, demanding transformative and just policies to improve the environmental and economic health of their communities. Before we start the presentation, um, I would like to give a few shout outs. Uh, we can start out with our Climate of Inequality Partners, uh, the Humanities Action Lab, where the Climates of Inequality Project resides, and organizations Alliance America, and Little Village Environmental Justice Organization known as El Vejo. Both organizations have been working on this project with the Latino Cultural Center for nearly three years now. Also, shout outs to our co-sponsors, the UIC Sustainability Fee, the Global Migration Working Group, Latin American and Latino Studies, Social Justice Initiative, the Department of Anthropology, CIMAS Project, Freshwater Lab, Great Cities Institute, Honors College, Las Gana Project, and Museums and Exhibition Studies. And finally, to the student panelists in my environmental and climate justice class, uh, Pam Jones, Ashley Maldonado, Susan Monge, and Raciel and Maciel Roa. The presentation will be about 30 minutes long, followed by a short conversation between the four students and our guest speakers. Um, so now I'm happy to introduce our guest speaker, Maria Lopez Nunez who is the Director of Environmental Justice and Community Development at Ironbound Community Corporation. Maria grew up in uh, Bushwick 
and remembers going back to Honduras as a child to connect with her roots and swim in her country's rivers. Uh, Maria has organized and helped the passage of historic and landmark city uh, and state le legislation in New Jersey, which will significantly increase the quality of life and protect children and families from eviction in the midst of the COVID pandemic. So you can see Maria's background uh, does an incredible job at bringing together the connections between environmental and climate justice alongside social justice. Um, so welcome to the program, Maria. We truly appreciate your time with us today and we're looking forward to, uh, to hear you. Uh, it's all yours. Gracias, gracias. Thank you. Um, thank you. I'm Maria Lopez Nunez. I am going to tell y'all, I'm actually at a march right now. <laughs> let me start off by saying that, let me see if you can see our people out here. I'll explain a little bit, but I wanted to let you know where I'm coming from. And if you hear background noise, por, por favor, just let me know on the chat and I'll try to put the windows up. But um, I'm Maria Lopez Nunez and I am coming to you from Newark, which is Lenin and Lape land, uh, up from Newark, New Jersey. Um, uh, I, <laughs> I am excited today because we've been out here in the streets, right? We're fighting actually the third power plant in our neighborhood. So I'll start by taking a step back and just giving you the landscape of who is Ironbound as a neighborhood, what is Newark as a city, you know? Um, a lot of people know about Newark and they, don't, they might not know that they know. So if you've been to New York City, chances are you probably stopped in Newark. You might've flown by us on a plane or you came to Newark airport or the, um, the trains led you to Newark Penn Station, right? On your way to New York City. Because unfortunately our city's history is one of people passing over us or just a stop on their way to or from New York or to Philly, right? We're one of those cities that's next to a big city, um, but we host all um, of the things that make the city work, right? So in Newark, um, like you were saying, we are host to the state's largest garbage incinerator that burns a million tons of trash a year. We are host uh, to the state's largest sewage waste treatment facility, which is actually who we're protesting right now. They wanna build a natural gas plant to give themselves power, even though in our neighborhood, it, that we already have two natural, or we already have two power plants in our neighborhood. Our neighborhood is only a four square mile neighborhood. So when I'm talking about the Ironbound and I'm listing all these things, they're in one small four square mile neighborhood where industry is right next to residents. We have no buffer zone. You can walk from the elementary school to the incinerator to the longest Superfund site in the country. And the longest Superfund site in the country is because here in Newark and in the Ironbound particularly, during the Vietnam War, we produced Agent Orange. In Ma we were the largest producers of Agent Orange here, right? And so Agent Orange was that chemical that they sprayed on plants during the Vietnam War so that they can see the, the guerrilla fighters, right? They would make the plants um, lose all their foliage. And a byproduct of Agent Orange is dioxin. Dioxin is one of the most, you know, y'all probably know this, but one of the most cancer causing chemicals to human beings. And that dioxin, which is a white powder, it was on the floor of the factories. And actually the workers in that, in the um, Agent Orange factory, Diamond Alkali, they were pushing the barrels of Agent of dioxin into the river because they didn't know or want to get rid of the byproduct properly. And that um, powder was making its way. So as trucks were picking up Agent Orange, they were getting dioxin on their wheels and they were spreading it all through the neighborhood. And so our neighborhood also, we used to have an in-ground pool, right outside, I have a lot of coworkers that used to swim in that pool that's now closed because of the Agent Orange. Um, other things that are happening in our neighborhood besides the two power plants, uh, an incinerator, a sewage treatment plant is uh, we also have a fat rendering plant, you know, where the fat, uh, you boil it to the uh, carcass separates from the bone and you can smell that, right? It's, uh, our sewage treatment plant is an old sewage treatment plant. So it's open pits of raw sewer, right? Like fields and fields of it. Like I said, it's the largest one in New Jersey. It processes the waste of 3 million households. Even though Newark as a city, we're only 250,000 people. Our incinerator takes the waste from New York City. 50% actually of those million tons of trash are coming from New York City and to be burned in our incinerator. You know, so when big cities are having zero waste initiatives, we have to check the fine print. That was zero waste within the jurisdictions of that city. 
um, into landfill. So actually that increased the amount that's coming over to the incineration. Um, we're at war right now, right? Um, we're at war with this idea of carbon sequestration. And we're seeing it in the form of a sludge plant who wants to come and boil um, sewage, <laughs> boil that sewer in uh, sewage sludge until it creates that like um, ash material that they want to put into bricks, right? We're just saying no more, which is kind of why we were out here today. It's also because, like I said, the in, uh, sewage treatment plant is trying to propose their third incinerator, uh, uh, third power plant in our neighborhood, right? Uh, a little bit about Ironbound, besides our sorted, <laughs> you know, um, treatment facilities, is that our, our actually our organization has been around for 52 years, right? So EJ, we loosely say that the environmental justice movement is about 30 years old. Though I would say our environmental justice movement is much older than that, right? It starts with indigenous people being displaced from their lands and people who were enslaved forced to come here and work in the land, right? And pe people from Africa who had ancestral connections and that was destroyed um, by, by slavery and indigenous people whose connection to the land was destroyed or attempted to be severed by colonization, right? We have to go that far back when we're thinking about environmental justice. And most importantly, we need to go back to people, to black and brown people, when we're talking about environmental justice. Like, I don't wanna be redundant because y'all have had a lot of speakers, but I always have to, just in case, because you, you never know. <laughs> Environmentalism has left people, um, people of color out. And so when we look around in our neighborhoods and we see the effects of racism, and how it, there is no accident that when you increase the amount of people of color in the neighborhood, the amount of pollution goes out. And in the state of New Jersey, race is actually the number one, um, race is actually the number one determinant of whether you live near contamination. That's actually what helped us pass our environmental justice law in New Jersey, is that our own Department of Environmental Protection had a map. And you can see on that map that the higher the concentration of people of color, the higher the concentration of pollution in our neighborhood. Industry has not, industry has not always been here, right? Um, industry is new. Our people were here first. Um, and industry has popped out ar around us because we haven't had the administrative ability to say no to industry and to be able to stop permitting from happening in our neighborhood, right? Um, that is a, one of the biggest insults uh, to our neighbor, <laughs> maybe I'll put the window up a little bit. Um, I don't know, y'all maybe can hear it, but I can, they're getting loud out there. Um, but yeah, we have not always had power, right? So Ironbound, um, as an organization, we started 52 years ago um, and we actually started as a childcare industry, right? Like a childcare center. And it was because the women in our neighborhood, they didn't have anywhere for their children to go to school. So we can, a lot of, well, not me, right? <laughs> but a lot of um, our, elders came together to form Ironbound Community Corporation. And I always have to give the disclaimer about the corporation in our name. At the time, <laughs> they thought that we were gonna be the People's Corporation, right? So um, they de we definitely wanted to have like invoke a sense of strength and a community corporation that would watch for our interests. And so in that spirit, we started a community school where the parents had all the say in terms of curriculum and what the kids ate. Our parents today, they still have the ability to hire and fire teachers. They decide the menu. They, um, uh, you know, they just make all the decision, our parent advisory board. So in that spirit, um, in the 70s, we were realizing there was explosions all over the neighborhood because there was a lot of illegal chemical dumping that was happening in our neighborhood. And warehouses, empty abandoned warehouses were catching on fire in the elementary schools. And that's where the parents who used to run us, who some are still on our board, they realized it doesn't matter if we invest all our strength and resources into children's education. If we cannot help them, if we cannot help them, um, have a safe environment, if we can't help the air that they breathe, then we're not getting better, you know? We're not improving the situation for them. Um, that we need to worry about their health, but we need to worry about their health in a holistic way. And to make sure that we're taking care of the air that they breathe, the water that they drink, the land, and the vegetables that are grown on that land, right? And so that's where our work came out of. It's um, 
our arm of the organization came from a committee against toxic waste. And we were actually protesting incinerations initially. And that was because at the time in New Jersey, we had a proposal, a brilliant proposal. Every municipality would get an incinerator, right? And every um, municipality would burn their own trash. And that was the wave of the 80s. That's everybody was gonna burn their own trash. But unfortunately, or fortunately, right? It depends how you look at it. Affluent um, counties, they actually showed us exactly who they are. They said, we're not gonna do this. We're gonna pay cities like Newark, poor cities like Newark, right? We were um, a resource starved city at the time. And we were a mostly black and brown city because we, like many um, cities across the country during the sixties, we had a rebellion, right? Against police brutality that actually drove white people out of the city of Newark. And so they were going to dump their incinerators into our city. And we had four incinerators proposed for our four square mile neighborhood. They were going to put them all down here because we have the, we're home to the industrial sector. And so Ironbound in the late 80s, um, we launched massive protests. People got arrested planting flowers, right? <laughs> Where they were going to put these incinerators. We were actually able to defeat that law that was going to put an incinerator in every county in New Jersey. But the unfortunate part, the very predictable part, is that only two cities ended up with incinerators. Two majority Black cities ended up with incinerators, right? Because our country is racist. So Newark ended up with an incinerator and Camden, which is another majority Black city in our um, state of New Jersey. We ended up with the incinerators, but we were able to help and protect everybody from being able, um, we were able to help everybody stop their incinerators um, from happening, but we still got saddled with ours. So, that's kind of where our fights against incineration started, right? It started from before the incinerator was built. Now we fight against hope. Hey, Kian, I'm on call. <laughs> hey, it's natural here, right? Um, we were able to stop all these incinerators from being built. Since then, we've actually had to stop medical waste incinerators. They had they tried to build one of the largest incinerators on the sea in our bay, because Newark's also home to the port of Newark and Elizabeth. Um, can you give me one second? Thank y'all. Hey, uh, I am also doing some management as I'm here. But so thank y'all for your grace and patience. But like I said, so we were, um, what was I? An incineration, right? Thank you. <laughs> I'm hoping we catch my place again. We've been fighting them since then from before they were built. We've fought off other proposals for more incineration. And then we've had to try, um, right now we're trying to clean up our renewable energy portfolio. And I know that's something that affects all of us across the country, right? They're trying to propose that we set up a renewable energy standard that includes incineration, includes clean coal, clean nuclear, right? They're just adding the word clean in front of things that have been dirty all along. And so that's our latest fight in New Jersey is trying to clean up our own renewable energy portfolio and get incineration kicked out because right now it's subsidized. So when we look at COVID and we look at the disproportionate death in our communities and how the environmental health and the, um, and, you know, the environmental racism, it, it played such a large part in who got COVID, who was hospitalized. In our community, one out of four people, one out of four kids have asthma. We have one of the largest um, asthma rates in the, in the state. And I even think the country, because I think in the country it's one out of 13, right? But this isn't the case, as I'm sure you've heard your whole semester, not just the case for Newark, it, there's just a city after city and community after community all across the country that they just um, share a couple of things. The majority, people of color, um, total, total call Willie. Um, the majority people of color, the majority low income, and they live next to pollution. That's what makes you an environmental justice community and you're probably facing these same issues. Um, other things we've had to fight here is that we're right next to the port of Newark and Elizabeth. And I know that if for those of you uh, near Long Beach, right, you're home to the largest port in the country. We have the second largest port and we serve the beast or the, I, I like to say the beating heart of capitalism here in New York City, right? And so all the um, containers that come into that port, they actually have to come through in order to get to New York City or to go to Philly or to go up to Boston, they actually have to come through our neighborhood because we're crisscross 
it's actually where our name comes from, Ironbound. It's because we're crisscrossed by railroad tracks and highway tracks, right? <laughs> we're actually cut off from the rest of our city by train tracks. And then we're surrounded on each side by major arteries that come in and out um, to, towards New York City. And so the trucks, in order to make shortcuts, they often use our neighborhood as a shortcut. And so we're, we breathe in the, the air to the tune of thousands of trucks um, thousands of trucks per day that put out that particulate matter 2.5 that once you breathe that in, it never leaves your body. You know, it's something that like our, our um, community ancestors here, right? They acknowledge that, that even if we help a kid excel at education, if they make it out of the, out of the neighborhood, um, if they make it out of the neighborhood, they're forever affected by the health impacts um, that happen in our neighborhood, right? And so that's been our story of trying to clean up this air. And I can't forget that while we try to clean things up, we try to fight back against gentrification, which is something I think all anybody who cares about environmental justice needs to really keep really super clear, is that as we clean up things, we may have to make sure that our people can stay here that we're not displaced, right? Um, because unfortunately we have felt the pressures that, you know, like, cause I don't want to tell you everything that would be impossible, but we had this one fight. It took us 20 years to win a park uh, alongside that river. That river that's a super fun site now has a park in front of it, which as a community organization, that was one of our greatest accomplishments to get that park by the river. However, <laughs> You know, because that used to be where the park is. It used to be full of container trucks and chemical drums, right? That were just piled sky high. A lot of people in our community forgot that the river was there, right? Because it's just this stinky thing that causes you issues. And actually, we have to put signs up because the crabs and the fish from the river um, are contaminated, right? And so... Um, as we built that park, we realized that the city was changing their zoning and building higher density, higher buildings, luxury housing, and that that stuff, that was not all for, it was not for us. <laughs> it was mostly not for us, right? And so that's why we've also passed inclusionary zoning laws that demand that when you build high buildings and high density buildings, you have to include affordable housing. We've gotten the right to council pass to make sure that every low income tenant has the right to an attorney. Um, we've also passed uh, the country's strongest rent control, right? These were all tools to make sure that as we improve our neighborhood, we're also making sure that everybody that's in our neighborhood can stay in our neighborhood. And that's what I love about being part of the environmental justice movement is that it is about everything, right? It is not just about the environment. It is not just about health. Um, it is also about immigration. It is about police brutality. It is about all the things <laughs> that affect black and brown people and low income people across the country. Um, one of our greatest accomplishments, which I'll end there and then I welcome questions because I'm just, <laughs> I don't like talking for that long. It's a little uncomfortable, but um, one of our greatest accomplishments was signed into law last year. And it was S-232, also known as the environmental justice law, the cumulative impacts law. And our environmental justice law, what we're so proud of is it's the, it's the strongest one in the country, but I hope that it, but I hope that it's not um, discouraging to anybody, right? I, I hope that our EJ law is just the beginning of a movement across the country to pass more and stronger environmental justice law. What S-232 does is that what I always say is a four-year-old could tell you. Um, it, a four-year-old can stand in a street corner and look around and say, Yo, hello, we'll tell them we'll get them later. Um, people looking for shirts now, you know, it gets dramatic around here. Sometimes I gotta break character. Um, S232, a four-year-old can stand in a street corner and say, hey, should we add another power plant here? And you could look around and say, you know what? This neighborhood, this four square mile neighborhood, it probably has too much damn crap in it already. We need to say no to things, right? And unfortunately, our laws don't allow, EPA does not currently allow local um, Department of Environmental Protections or Air Board to take into consideration everything, to take into consideration the cumulative impact. So what happens when you have a power plant, two power plants, a sludge plant, an incinerator, you know, when you pile things on, you start piling on the burden on people who are already impacted by the stress of racism, by bad education, by police brutality, by an immigration system trying to get them, right? And then you add all this pollution 
you should be able to consider the cumulative stress of a neighborhood, the stressors. So what the EJ law does is that for new proposals, if they're found to, first it defines what is an environmental justice community. Environmental justice community in New Jersey is any community that's 40% people of color or 40% linguistic isolation, because we know that the census does not do people right sometimes, or 35% low income. If your community hits any of those markers, then that means it triggers extra review. And that extra review, it, it looks at the industry and says, are you gonna add to the problems that already exist in the neighborhood? Notice, it doesn't say disproportionality, and that's intentional, because disproportionality has no legal basis, right? Or it would be hard. We didn't even wanna end up in court. This just says, if you increase, Increase is increase is increase, right? So if you contribute to the air pollution by a pound, you're increasing it. And so that requires, it means that the DEP shall deny those permits. It must deny those permits, right? It doesn't give it ambiguous. It doesn't say, give us an environmental assessment. Let's figure out if you're doing a problem. Because I see a lot of laws do that. They just kind of say, let's assess the problem. And then it doesn't require anybody to do anything about it. And that's always been our concern. And that's why we're so proud of our law is that when they when it's found to be a problem, then um, then they shall deny the permits. And then for existing permits, we didn't win this one. So hopefully one of y'all can win this someday for us. Um, for existing permits, it does um, for expansions and renewals, it conditions that permit, right? The law I'm mentioning is S-232. It's the Environmental Justice Law of New Jersey. Um, and it's on the state level and it requires our um, Department of Environmental Protection to be able to really pay attention to the stressors in our neighborhood. And if things contribute to it, they deny new facilities and they permit, uh, they condition the permits for existing and expansions, you know? So S-232, it wasn't simple. And it took us 12 damn years to be able to pass this law. <laughs> it was not something we did overnight. And then we greatly benefited from the um, the black uprisings that happened last summer, right? Like we took that power and said, we're gonna take a stand for environmental justice and make sure that we push this law that's been trying to undo and fight back against the centuries of racism in this country and stop allowing all this dumping that has happens in black and brown communities. So I see some questions are coming in, so I'll stop there and let y'all help us out. Oh, thank you so much, Maria. Gracias. And I love that you're giving us a sense of, uh, with all the multitasking that you're so good at, uh, of what it's like to be on the front line preventing further damages in the community. Uh, we're going to open this up for the students um, who are in the panel asking you questions. And then I think we'll have some time also, and, and Jorge will facilitate that, I believe, uh, for you to try to answer some of the questions that have been put on the chat. So um, I think the students can uh, go ahead now. Hi, Maria. Thank you again for sharing your advocacy and even seeing you straight up right now doing what you love and advocating for your community. It means a lot to see that um, representation and role model. Um, one question I have um, in terms of like, you know, since you said Ironbound has a lot of these, you know, um, you know, corporations and causing harm to the environment and aware of that some citizens could see all these issues, the health concerns, the environmental pollution. Have you um, like encountered citizens that even living in Ironbound see this and then they're still like hesitant of advocating or against it or saying, oh, but their jobs, you know what I'm saying? So um, I just have that kind of question. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, one of my organizing, um, I don't know if it's an organizing principle, but I'm like, there's people who care. Don't waste your time trying to change the mind of everyone. That's not what your job is as an organizer. Your job as an organizer is to go find those people that already care. They just didn't know, you know, if when people learn about this and they're motivated, bring them over. And then once your crowd is big enough, those people that were on the fence, they'll join you, right? So mm -hmm. what I see a lot of organizers doing is going to cut their teeth like, oh, I'm going to convince this one person. <laughs> We're mm -hmm. not here to convince everybody. We have to believe in our people and believe that they make their own decisions, right? Because also environmental justice is about people speak for themselves, self-determination. We're not here to force anybody to think the way we do, right? I do find that most people, once they see the real deal, they come mm -hmm. along. 
even the mm -hmm. folks that want the jobs like we we have a we struggle with warehousing here you know mm -hmm. and we take in a position that's not so anti-warehouse but we do want community benefits agreements we want to make sure that those jobs are good jobs on paper we want that signed in a contractual agreement not just like your word we never take industry's word. They betrayed us too many times. We never take our bureaucrats or our elected officials' words. We need people to deliver on promises and put those things in writing. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Maria, I appreciate it. Hi, Maria. Yes, thank you again for joining us. That was great hearing more about um, everything that's been going on in the New York area. I was terribly surprised by everything. Um, but my question is, you already mentioned the uh, environmental law that got passed last year and how it took you guys 12 years to get that law passed. I was wondering if you could elaborate a little more on the efforts that actually went into passing that law and have you actually seen it at play this year, especially now that you are protesting because of another facility wanting to open up another plant? Yeah, for those of y'all with policy experience, right? Like you pass a law, it gets signed, and it usually has an effective by date, right? And so our law is actually not effective yet. Right now we've been in the rulemaking. And one thing that I'm super proud of is that as we made this law um, real, we were actually changing the way the bureaucracy works. So usually in rulemaking, um, the Department of Environmental Protection would pass the law, they have to write the rules. So they would go into a back room and start designing the law, usually with industry right there, right? <laughs> we actually said, you have to give community stakeholders a piece of that. So they actually have been having a series of community and stakeholder engagement sessions um, once a month for the last year to answer questions from the community perspective of what are the important pieces of the law that they need to consider in terms of writing their guidance of who it's gonna impact. How we've seen the law, I think that the law is putting a lot of pressure um, a lot of pressure into our neighborhood because we have these facilities where we're trying to slide in before the law becomes effective right so we're actually as we pass the strongest law in the country we're under the biggest assault we've ever seen right now out of all the stationary sources in the state of new jersey 40 percent of them are for my neighborhood not my city if i consider my city it's 60 percent coming to one city in the whole state but 40% of them are in my neighborhood in the Iron Pound, right? And so that's how we see that the law is scaring the industry, scaring them so much that they're trying to rush their applications in. And unfortunately, that's creating a lot of work. So I had agreed to come onto this panel with y'all a couple <laughs> months ago, <laughs> but I didn't need, know I would have to be fighting this um, power plant <laughs> like we're doing it today. And so obviously I wasn't gonna change everything for my whole team and then we're making it work. So thank y'all for allowing me this flexibility and being patient with me. Thank you. Yeah, thank you so much for um, for being here, uh, here and being able to um, to present um, and, and tell us about the community. Um, it's inspiring because we see a lot of examples around here too that I've found, you know, like a lot of parallels um, with what's happening in, in um, Newark. And we were actually looking um, at um, at some of the industries um, that that are being combated that in, in the area. Um, and one of them, which worked with like animal um, byproducts and stuff, they had a pamphlet and they promoted themselves as this giant protector of the environment um, and you know fighting for for their own version of environmental justice um, in a in a in a pretty robust like kind of marketing strategy and I was wondering if you could tell us a little bit about what your experience has been how you may um, you and 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 the movement may have combated that type of very strong marketing from these big corporations yeah like I said I love the environmental justice movement, right? First off, it's tiny. <laughs> we all know each other, all right? Um, I looked at the list of people presented. I was like, kill them. <laughs> so that's really cool about the movement, um, that it's both low barrier to entry and everyone is welcome, right? And hopefully we'll see themselves reflective in our movement. Um, how we've been combating is, right? Like no false solutions, right? Like really calling out what is a false solution. Things that seem like they're good for you, that industry is constantly presenting over and over of like, we're gonna save this. We're gonna, you know, carbon, we're seeing this at the cop right now, that net zero bullshit. 
And I don't know if I'm aggressive, so excuse me. <laughs> but, you know, it is. It's just worthless propaganda that we're mm -hmm. seeing over and over again um, being pushed by industry. And what I love is watching a uh, movement spread and people being more hip to it, right? Being hip to what is carbon carbon capture, carbon sequestration. Like they're making up signs for what is reverse fracking or incineration, really, right? Um, and we're turning things on their head and we're helping people really see to be vigilant against corporate greenwashing and to realize that we're not going to trade or create a stock market for pollution. How are we ever going to let the people who got us into this mess design the solutions that get us out of it? So when you see Exxon strongly supporting a carbon tax, that's just because it's not mm -hmm. going to affect them. And even then, we hear them say that they don't even support that. They're that they think that our people are that dumb, right? That they can pretend to support something that doesn't even work anywhere, <laughs> you know? So if I was them, I would be watching the people and it seems like the people are actually wising up and I would really credit the environmental justice movement for always calling it out. Sometimes people thought that we were uncompromising, right? That we, because we know the truth. And for us, this is not theoretical. It's life and death in our neighborhoods, right? When we're talking about clean air, it's because so many of us have an asthma. My own mom got COVID and we've always lived next to a textile factory or, you know, in a bad air quality area. And when she got COVID, it wasn't simple. My mom's still on oxygen. She got COVID last year in January. She was there for three months. It was agonizing. And the amount of people we've lost in our neighborhood because of COVID, because we had underlying health conditions that comes from the environment we live in. And then people blame it on us, right? They're victim blaming. They blame it on us as if we just don't make the right choices for ourselves. Never looking around at the environment that we've been mm -hmm. handed, that we've been forced to live with. Thank you very much for sharing that, Maria. Yeah, hi. Um, so me, well, my question would probably be more of like, I guess the timeline that you've been speaking about, how long it's been, taking for you to like um your organization to kind of like get to some place with all these laws and everything like I just wanted to ask like what would you advise other organizations and other parts of like the U.S. like that are struggling the same way like what advice would you give them um that also have been going this struggle within like years like what what advice would you give them you know so they won't feel like they're not getting somewhere but at the same time they are in a way it's just taking a while yeah i would say you have to keep organizing and you have to keep building relationships organizing is not just about bringing people out to a rally or a protest organizing is about building the community relationships amongst each other when we're not protesting things you know when we're not um yeah, when we're not protesting things, when we're not just um, having to show up to the hearing, we need to build relationships so that we do have like strong community fabrics, right? So that people check on their neighbor after a storm, so that people feel protected and held. That's why while we always protest the things we want to see, um, as we protest the things we want to see, um, Again, uh, protest against the things we don't want to see in our neighborhood. We need to make sure that the things we want to see are being, those seeds are being planted today, right? Like in our neighborhood, we have this giant community farm, right? Because we mm -hmm. want to see people reconnect with the land and also just have a place to hang out. We just throw barbecues to just meet our neighbors and hang out. So when I say organizing, I don't just mean the protests and the petitions, because I will say we need to be very careful in our movement and not just burn people out. We also have to recharge them, recharge their humanity and their spirit. You know, we cannot become ex extractive. Or we only come to people and want to talk to them about the bad stuff. We also have to vision together, right? Share cultural activities together and make sure that we're grounding ourselves and grounding ourselves in our relationships. Thank you, yes. <laughs> Hi, Maria, this is Jorge from the Latino Cultural Center. We have a couple questions that folks submitted, so I'll, I'll read them to you and see if we can get some response in the next um, eight to 10 minutes that we have. <laughs> um, someone by the name of Kalia Linear, when you were talking about local policy and some of the local examples in Newark from Agent Orange to garbage incinerators, et cetera, they had a question around not just the local level, but have you worked on the federal level for some of these laws and bills to be passed and 
how does your organizing shift when discussing federal policy as opposed to local work? Ooh, that's an easy question, right? <laughs> um, thank you. Thank you for that question. It's important. And one thing I'm so proud of is how we've been able to go in our um, in our neighborhood or how we've been able to take our neighborhood story, right? Because we're just a neighborhood in the city of Newark. There's the whole city of Newark and we don't organize it. We're really just organizing our neighbor in our neighborhood. But because of the things we saw in our neighborhood, we, we've helped pass city laws, right? Like the right to counsel. Actually, we... We were under the, I don't know if y'all know who Governor Christie is, but he's like a Trump and he was our governor for eight years before Trump was in office. He tried to be uh, Trump's vice president, but we realized we couldn't move something at the state level when he was in charge. And so we passed actually the environmental justice law on the city level and as a symbolic gesture, right? And we we're the first city in the country to have an environmental justice human impact law. Because sometimes you really do have to go bottom up. You got to figure out what your strategy is because for the federal government to see it, and that's what I, what I figure is the strategy, um, what, what we figure is the strategy that we need, right? Um, as we pass on the federal level to ever see a federal cumulative impacts law, we're going to have to pass it in more states. So that's why I said New Jersey is the first, but we need other states to follow and follow in a good example. Push the boundary. Don't water it down, right? Um, so, of course, it's different, but I would say I try to follow a bottom-up approach to where I want to go to make sure that we do have our neighborhoods, that our communities are with us as we take things um, up levels. Right now, I do have the pleasure of being, I, I was appointed to the White House Environmental Justice Advisory Council, right? Biden made that. And that's a privilege to... Uh, that speaks to the movement. The movement helped make that happen, uh, that there is an environmental justice advisory council on, on behalf of the White House, and it's the first one. And that's because the movement's been working hard for 30 years to make sure that on the federal level, we're being heard from the neighborhood all the way to the feds. And so now I want y'all to pay attention to what's happening with Justice 40. Justice 40 supposedly is for our communities. We need to make sure and guard, have what are the guardrails? to make sure it's protecting our communities, to make sure that it's the things our communities want and not to further fund false solutions. Justice 40 is about making sure, and it's a whole of government approach. It is not just about the EPA. We need to look at the Department of, of Homeland Security that is in charge of FEMA. We need to look at HUD, right? And how public housing, does it have air conditioning? Is it in a flood zone? We need to look at Department of Labor, what are they investing in? What are the trainings they're investing in? Department of Transportation, you know? Um, so I know that that's a lot, but I, I, I think, yes. I don't know if that answered the question, right? But it is all different depending what level you go, but they all build on each other and there is a relationship. Every move you make to move this really annoying needle of justice, it, it has ripple effects on all different levels, especially when you get it done right. Thank you for the response, Maria. Your response elicited a question around um, the current United Nations Climate Change Conference. And so folks are asking, what are your thoughts on what is currently happening at COP26? And um, someone pointed out that there seems to be more fossil fuel lobbyists at, this, at the um, UN Climate Change Conference. Yeah, um, I mean, that's why our organizing needs to get tighter. You know, and like I said, we just cannot keep protesting. We need to show up to the polls. That's just really important. Mm -hmm. We need to show up to the polls. We do need to vote. I know that they say, oh, voting doesn't matter. Well, guess what? They, they said that to black and brown people and poor people that voting doesn't matter, right? And obviously you don't stop at voting. You have to push, you have to vote. You need to go to your city council. I would say you have to get involved in the local level and make your way up. You need to let these elected officials know you're watching them and that you're willing to act on what they say because mm -hmm. when they say oh this is the public opinion i think that was, there was a good there's a good movie i just watched it on netflix last night okay so pardon me but i think y'all should watch it it's called salone and she was she's a lobbyist but we need to learn what they're doing and make sure that we're doing it better <laughs> i know that in this country we always say audrey lord right like the master's tools won't dismantle the master's house. In my country, we actually say, you steal their tools to burn their house down with. <laughs> but I would just say this in the middle, at least learn their tools and know and watch them. And we need to hold them accountable at home. Because obviously when they go overseas, they just start saying whatever they want. And most of our folks are not rich enough to go to the cop. They're mostly held in European mm -hmm. countries for heaven's sakes, right? Like, how is it that we're actually gonna make our presence? We need to really build and build 
steadily and put the pressure and remind our politicians that we're watching them. We're watching them when they come home and all the fake promises that they give the rest of the world, right? We're going to hold them to it. Thank you for, for that, Maria. I think as we talk about sort of the master's tools and sort of, it makes us think of the government response to environmental disasters, right? Or the lack of. <laughs> Um, and I think so often we end up highlighting the strength and grit of individuals to survive and persist. Um, this often happens in various responses to environmental disasters where the onus, the responsibility is picked up by the individuals and the community directly impacted. Um, could you talk about how you sort of see that balance between highlighting individual perseverance while holding the government accountable and sort of not distracting from that? Yeah, I mean, I don't blame people, right? Like, I never say, oh, you you as an individual lower your carbon footprint. That was the fossil fuel industry. It's just like recycling. They gave us recycling, for heaven's sakes, right? And now everybody's so worried about recycling. We're still not recycling. 90% of the, the, the plastics we throw out can't be recycled. But they have us on this wild goose chase to just put a blue bin to save the world and not pay attention to them. Um, I might have lost your question because I get really wild up about industry. <laughs> but um, uh, yeah, oh, the individual, right? I do always try in our community meetings of making that connection for people. We need to go deeper than treating the symptoms. We need to go to the root causes of things. We need to like start um, having a root cause analysis, trying to get to the bottom. This is racism. This is capitalism and exploitation, right? And how do we actually pull the rug out from underneath the system in whatever way we can. We need to change the rules, first of all, right? Changing the rules is important. That's what we did with S232. We need to change the narrative, showing that people of color really care about the environment, that we care about our lives, that this is our lives. Climate change doesn't affect everybody equally. You know, we need to lead those solutions. Um, we need to move the money, okay? We can't be having shy conversations about money. Controversial opinion. I. I'm trying to be Robin Hood, right? Trying to take money. Your local organizations need those donations. Don't go to the big organizations for impact. Go to your local community groups, show up to community meetings, you know? Like I said, bottom up approach. Maria, one of the questions that we received is sort of addressing the different social identities that people have um, and how that sort of impacts their organizing. And so the question that's posed here is, do you have any advice on how to organize a community where a majority of individuals are undocumented, therefore can't vote, et cetera? Um, they know from personal experience, family uh, sometimes refrain from frontline action out of fear. Absolutely, our neighborhood is mostly undocumented, right? And so we, uh, we get a lot of solidarity, but we figure out what the level of risks are for what different activities. We don't, that's why we're very careful about this, putting bodies on the line. Right, because that that doesn't mean the same thing for everyone. Also, you know, when our, our black and brown neighborhoods and neighbors, right, we don't want to put them in front of the police. The police might, you know, like there are so many risks associated. So when you're doing actions, you need to be very intentional about what's the purpose. Who can get harmed? Do you have enough big enough group? When the group is big enough, there is power in numbers. I don't recommend those actions where you're there with cuatro gatos, as I like to say. You know, I always tell that to my team. We can't be us and cuatro gatos. Then we're not doing a protest, you know? <laughs> Have people call also. Just call the elected officials. Exploit those numbers. You know, I've even tried that on bureaucrats because they're not used to being called up. They think that's for elected officials. I call their offices. I have my community call their offices. That's a low risk thing. You don't even have to give your real name. You know, we can't be so stricklers about how our actions look. We can blow up people's mailboxes, right? Like with emails. I don't mean blow up. I mean, throw up their, throw a lot of emails and really slow down their day. There could be a lot of ways to have direct actions that are not putting people's bodies on the way and not be putting people's in, people in harm's way. You can always avoid putting people's in harm's way by having enough of a contingency. So that means you need to get your organizing tight and you got to make sure that you have confirmed how many numbers you're going to have. Thank you for that, Maria. I think we can agree that voting, participating in civil disobedience, et cetera, are tools, right? But there's many ways to be politically involved. Um, earlier, you, you mentioned how environmental, environmentalism has, has left people of color out. Um, this question that Sofia Martinez submitted is around sort of 
where your passion comes from. Um, I think we got a good sense of where it comes from, but the question is, do you think that you would have been this passionate about this issue if you grew up in a different neighborhood as if, if you weren't directly affected by these issues? Who knows? And I don't wonder about that no more, <laughs> not too much, right? Because this is the life I got. Um, and, you know, I don't know. I So I, I you know, like I, I, I think was said earlier, I'm a little more uncomfortable talking about myself. So give me a second. But I grew up in Honduras and it, my mom, when we came here, she reminded me, I didn't come chasing the American dream. I came here because the U.S. is in my country, right? The U.S., is overthrown my democracies. And the US and many imperial other countries have stolen our resources. And I think that's the case for a lot of immigrants. It's forced immigration, really, you know, like, so I feel really passionate because I feel like so many people, including black and brown people who are already in this country, they're old things from this country, right? They're old reparations. Um, and sorry, I keep getting calls because it's the end of the march, but they're old reparations. And that's where my passion comes from, is making sure that our society, it talks about justice. We need to hold them to it. And I really think that justice is a contact sport, right? Like we can't just dream about it at home. We need to hang out with people and be in community to demand for justice, right? And so I'm thankful that I grew up with people that I don't know, we have each other's back, right? I don't say that I'm thankful for these circumstances because I don't think anybody should have these circumstances. Mm -hmm. But I think we need to be reflective of the community that we have and the strengths that we do have um, to push forward, to not give up. Or as someone in my office, and I think it's the right thing, to just not give up at the same time. Because you're going to give up at moments. At moments, this work is hopeless. <laughs> and it feels like the whole world is against you and it might be in that moment, right? But as long as you have your community and y'all take turns with who's having the hopeless day, we'll all make sure that we keep going because this is a long arc of history. And it's not just, you know, people say it's for the young people. No, it's for all of us, right? This is an intergenerational struggle. All of us have the right to see a hopeful society today and tomorrow. And we see glimmers of that every time that we're together, fighting for something together or building and planting something together. Maria, thank you so much for your honesty. I think your quote of the US is in my country um, in relation to forced migration mm. will stick to, to many of us. Um, thank you for, for sharing your work and your passion. I think it's rubbing off uh, on all of us. Uh, to be mindful of time, I'm going to send it back to Rosa, who will close out today's program. Thank you, Jorge. Uh, y gracias again, Maria. You're incredible um, for sharing the uh, Iron Bond story and all the endless efforts that uh, advocates like you are leading to tackle the local pollution problems and also, you know, cultivating solutions that are also making massive contribution to climate action, right? So we really appreciate your energy, the time that you have given to us today. Um, we have been honored to hear you and we will continue to be in touch with you and sending you lots of love and luck uh, and to all the people there to continue the struggle. Anything that we can help you here uh, at UIC and the Latino Cultural Center, you know where to find us, right? Um, yeah, and, and also, you know, thank you to the students panelists uh, the LCC staff, and of course, to all of you listening for sharing a space, um, curiosity, uh, and also purpose to build and sustain collective power, which, like Maria say, is um, necessary 100%. It is the only way that we can demand uh, a really bold and equitable uh, environmental and climate solutions that uh, at the end of the day have to benefit working class community and not the wealthy few. So um, having said that, I just want to close with reminding everyone that um, again, the Climates of Inequality presentation for um, the two seasons are available in our website. So check them out when you get a chance. Um, and um, also um, it's almost the end of the semester. So for all the students that are joining us here today, best of luck with, the, with your uh, finals. And we really, really are very appreciative that you are here today with us learning more from Maria. Um, uh, who is really at the core of um, 
you know, what is really happening in communities like Ironbound and also our own communities here in Chicago, which are many of them who are what we call uh, sacrificing, so, uh, sacrificing zones. So uh, having said that, uh, good evening to everyone and uh, be healthy. <laughs>